Camillo has probably a books full of, he gave some lectures last week, Camillo DeLewis, a book full of, of notes on this. But these are very well behaved sets. So, you know, like manifolds, they have tangents and they're Euclidean space at almost every point. So we can make sense of directional derivatives and so forth and so on. In fact, that kind of characterizes what these sets look like. They're exactly the subsets for which tangents are Euclidean space almost everywhere. Good. Oh, hey. Okay. Fine. Okay. That is harder. So, so Cantor sets. Um, but, but I mean, even there, one has to be extremely careful about what you mean. Um, because if it's a subset of, I mean, so, so you can take a Cantor set inside, inside some two-dimensional space, which is like, say, one and a half dimensional, and it will not be one, one rectifiable, but it, but it can be uh, two rectifiable, right? So one has to even there be kind of careful. It'll be measure zero there, so it won't matter. Uh, worse, you can actually get Cantor ex examples that are Cantor set, uh, that are rectifiable, but you can get them that aren't as well. <laughs> it, this, is, this is less trivial. If I actually finish early, maybe I'll, I'll write it out explicitly for you. It's not hard. But we'll take a uh, you know five to eight minutes. Okay, so um, now we move on to I think our last real piece of meat. Uh, so so Jones beta numbers, right? So so. So as we said in uh, what I kind of just erased, uh, one major issue um, in terms of applying Reifenberg to actual applications is that in principle we have integral estimates. We, we, we don't have point-wise estimates. Um, and for that reason and actually a bunch of others as it turns out, it is more convenient to work with measures. So, so what we're going to want to talk about is we're going to try to want to understand in the same sense that the Hausdorff uh, um, distance was used to control how far away a set was from an affine plane, we want to know how far away is a measure from, from at least, well, at least being contained inside of a plane is in fact how, how it's going to be written. So, so let, let, let's write the definition first. So, so given a measure mu, In an integer, k, uh, we define the, I'm going to call the L2 beta numbers, but that's all I'll really work with in this lecture, to be the following. So k, it's a function of x and r, and you should view x and r as being a ball here, right? So what I'm really asking, what this is going to measure is, how far away is mu from being contained inside an affine subspace on this ball, centered here of that radius, right? This, this is what we're asking. And Just like with the Reifenberg condition, we're going to emphemum over all affine subspaces. But what we're going to emphemum is the, the scale invariant integral So what we're saying is we take L, we look at the distance function to L and square it. This is beta squared, sorry. So it's the square root of that. Um, we look at the distance function to L. We ask, you know, for every point in the support of mu, how far away is that point from L? And we square it. And then we integrate it over the whole ball, right? Reasonable thing to do. Um, this here is exactly scale invariant. What that kind of means is that if I take a ball of radius r, we scale it to the ball of radius 1, and I pull mu back by that. Um, by, uh, <coughs> in, in the suitable normalized sense, then, then the beta number will be the same on the ball of radius 1, right? We always love scale invariant things that are floating around here. You should call that an exercise. Okay, so some comments. Um, note, I mean, this is not in some sense controlling how close uh, 
L is to mu, it's controlling how close mu is to L, right? You know, mu could be zero, for instance, right? And this is zero. If our set was zero, it would not be close to an affine plane the way we defined it before. So all we're asking now is that, that we're asking how close mu is to being contained in a plane, but there can be holes, right? It could just be a subset of the plane that's contained in it if this was zero. And we'll do some examples. And actually, so, so I'm gonna do three examples. And these examples are meant to motivate the following. They're meant to ask the question, imagine I have a completely random measure mu, and I know something uh, about the, 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 the k-dimensional beta numbers. Maybe I know a lot. Maybe it's super, super nice, right? A lot nicer than we'll end up assuming in the theorem. Maybe it's zero, right? Or maybe it's decaying polynomial, or maybe we know a lot about it. What can we say about mu? What can we and can't we say about mu in these cases? because we want to have some fuel for what we have a hope for controlling. So, example. Um, let me just start with the silly one. So let, let's say mu k is a measure which is completely contained inside some affine plane. Well, then beta k of xr is zero for every x and r positive, right? So, so th this is essentially an if and only if condition, right? However, precisely with this in mind, uh, let, let me consider the following. Um, let, let me actually pick a, a, uh, an example that does this. So, so let's let mu k be the following. So L k, I'm just going to say, is a subspace even, right? So affine through the origin for the sake of argument. So let's let it be some multiple of the Dirac delta at the origin plus some multiple of the k-dimensional Hausdorff measure on L. So recall what this is, right? This means that the measure, so just looking at this for a second, this measure of a set means that I take the set, restrict it to L, and integrate with a little big measure, right? That, that's how you should understand this. Uh, then, I mean, it's just an example of the above, right? So, but I, I really wanna fixate on it for one second. So it's zero for every X and R again. Uh, not just every X and R is somehow the point. Also for every alpha naught and alpha k. And why does that matter? Well, it matters because it's saying that even if this is flat out zero all the time, there's no measure bound on this thing, of course. Right, we have no, I mean, so in the end, that's our goal, right? We want rectifiable structures on measures. We want measure bounds on measures. And this is saying that flat out, even if this is zero, you have no measure bound on this, right? It can be absolutely arbitrarily big. Right, there's no stopping it from being large. However, what it doesn't rule out is being k-rectifiable because of course it's inside a k-dimensional plane. So now, let's give an example that rules out being k-rectifiable. And make you think most of this lecture has been pointless. You guys have the good chalk. So let's see, example. So let me do something on the complete opposite extreme. Uh, notice that although I called that mu k, that example, I could have actually broken it up into two, which I might have called mu k and mu minus, because one of those pieces there is very k-dimensional, and one of them is strictly less than k-dimensional behaving. It's a Dirac delta, right? It's, it's, it's constituted on something that's even less than k-dimensional in support. With that in mind, I'm going to define a mu plus, which is going to be support on something bigger than k-dimensional. Right, so let's let mu plus be defined to be simply epsilon times the standard look bake measure on Rn, maybe on the ball of radius one or two or whatever. 
So the n-dimensional Hausdorff measure, it's a standard Lebesgue measure. If you want, on the ball of radius two. So all I'm doing is integrating, right? So I can do this and I can ask, what are its beta numbers? Now, no longer are they zero, right? They're not contained inside a k-plane, but they turn out to be extremely close, right? So a nice exercise, which is like three lines, but I mean, you should do it. Um, is that the k-dimensional beta numbers of this example are equal to omega n, the volume of the ball of radius one in Euclidean space, times epsilon squared, I'm squaring this side, times r to the n minus k. So if k is, say, one, whatever, something less than n, look what's happening. This is always small. Not only is it small, it's decaying polynomially, right? So, I mean, you will never in your life have a practical example where the beta numbers behave better than that, right? right? Where they are small and decaying polynomially. That's awesome, right? So, so well, what's good and bad about this? Well, what's, what, what's, what's terrible about this is that it's clearly not k-rectifiable. So these are small and, and in fact decaying, and yet I have no k-dimensional structure on my measure. By the way, if you haven't thought much about measures before, these are simply a nice collection of examples to think about, right? You get to kind of manipulate them a little bit and get your head around measure some. Okay. Now, I want to do one more example um, before stating theorems. Oh, hey, let me state an exercise. Here's an exercise, actually, because I, I really want you guys to do this in the next thing, so I'm going to write it down. This gets used constantly, right, right? So, so it's, it's, imagine I have two balls, which, which are roughly comparable, right? So, so the way I can write that is, say the ball of twice the radius 2s around y is contained inside the ball of radius r around x, is contained inside the ball of radius, I don't know, 100s, whatever, around y again, right? So, so. Pictorially, I'm saying, here's my ball of radius r around x. Here's basically what my ball around radius y looks like, right? So it's, it's contained in there maybe, but if I multiply s by some big number, the ball of radius r is contained in it, right? So they're comparable balls. Then the claim is that the, the, the beta, beta number here controls the beta number here. Right? So, so then beta k of y s is less than or equal to some dimensional constant. Anyway, times the beta number of xr. This is one of these examples that, that, that if your head's in the right place is obvious. And if it's not obvious, it's because, well, you need to spend an hour thinking about these things. That's all, that's just what happens. So if you find yourself writing like a page to prove it, you're thinking too hard, right? Note the other direction is highly non-true, right? I mean, the big ball controls the small ball, and not the other way around. Okay. That being said, I now want to present one more example before I do theorems, and then we're going to do theorems. So, so in fact, uh, the last example is very easy. It just builds on these two. So let's let mu equal to mu k plus mu plus. So exactly from these two examples, right? That's it. Then the, the, the exact same computation say that if we use the affine space L there as your test function, what you end up getting is something along the lines of the beta numbers of this guy are once again behaving what worse like these guys are. I'm going to throw a larger dimensional constant in front, because why not? But I think it's just four. So the beta numbers are small. They're actually decaying. And why am I pointing this example out? Because now we have no k-rectifiable structure. We have no measure upper bounds, right? One, one, one seems doomed. 
Um, however, it turns out, I mean, what do we get from kind of looking at this example? We get from a completely, I mean, for, for at least this example, we do at least get that we can split the measure, I mean, stupidly, it's, it's defined that way, right? We, we, we can split it up into two pieces, one of which is k-rectifiable without maybe measure bounds, the other of which isn't k-rectifiable but has measure bounds, right? And, and the basic theorem here is that's always true, right, right? So if we have reasonable control over the beta numbers, we can always do such a decomposition, right? It's either, it, it's measures either bounded or it's k-rectifiable or it's a sum of two things like this. So the theorem, which is what I'm calling the rectifiable Reifenberg theorem. This, this is basically a slightly, uh, this is basically comes from, from the paper with Nick Edelin and, and Daniel Leval Torch. We don't phrase it quite this way. We make sure to phrase it in as confusing a manner as possible when, when we wrote the paper. Um, so so let, let's take a, you know, a nice Borel measure mu. Um, And for the sake of argument, I'm going to say it's inside the ball of radius 1. I'm going to, do I have enough room here? If I don't have enough room, then I should just stop before I get to the end and decide I don't have enough room. Okay. Theorem, so our measure of mu's in the ball of radius 1. Um, we're going to assume the following holds. So, so what do I mean by, by the beta numbers being nice? I mean that the integral over the ball of radius 1 of the integral from 0 to 2, and I'll explain what this term here means. This is basically like a Dini sum. So what I'm doing here is that every point, so, so what, what does this mean here? It's dr over r, right? Essentially, the, the nice way to think about this, it, it's, it's like uglier to write but easier to think, is that using that exercise there, in fact, so remember, if one's going to get rectifiable in volume control, it's got to be a stronger condition than Reifenberg's in some sense, right? So somehow each one of these things on a given scale is like Reifenberg's condition. So something must be stronger in this information, right? And if we let Ri be, say, 2 to the minus i, so this is what I'll call scales, right? So 1, a half, a fourth, an eighth, right? I'm going to call these things scales, right? So this integral here at a given point. is roughly speaking, I'm not being super precise here, like the sum over all scales less than or equal to 2, say, of beta k of x ri. Right? So, so, you know, th this has like, you know, unit volume on any, any scale range, right? So I'm basically saying at every point, I'm going to look at how far away on the ball of radius 1, say, it is from being contained in, a, in, a, in some k-dimensional plane, and I'm going to sum that up with how far away it is on every scale below it, right? So this is definitely a stronger condition than, 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 than Reifenberg's, right? It's not just on one scale, it's a sum over all scales, and that is assumed at least an integral to be bounded. There should absolutely be a square on the right-hand side. Thank you. Uh, then, how are we doing? Okay. Mu is equal to mu k plus mu plus. We can break mu into a sum of two measures, right? Such that the following holds. One, well, the, the mass of mu plus is bounded, right? So we think of this as being like the larger dimensional piece, like, like, like the Euclidean guy over there. It's even bounded by a multiple of that. And two, if I'm going to call it k, is the support of mu k, then k is k-rectifiable, k-rectifiable. 
uh, with finite Hausdorff mass. We'll do better in this in one second. So in particular, looking at this example, the measure is infinity, but the support of the measure ha ha has bounded finite, this should be on the ball of radius one, of course, the way we're discussing over here, has bounded finite k-dimensional mass, right? I mean, in fact, this actually has a packing estimate on it. So in fact, the volume of the ball, so Minkowski estimate, the volume of the ball radius R around this guy. So this thing can't be dense, right? It's actually gotta be well behaved and balls around it have to be well behaved. C R to the N minus K and the packing content of this guy is bounded by some dimensional constant. So not only is the Hausdorff content bounded, but the, the, the packing content, any covering of this actually is bounded. What's that? What's T? No, those do not. That's the whole point, right, exactly. So like over there, right, some, some, somehow you're gonna split up into a piece where there's not gonna be a gamma there. Okay, so, so this is actually the, the, the main thing that that one uses in the applications for, for, for the singular sets. Um, I'd like to write a couple corollaries. I have about five minutes. I think I can do it. So definition, because this is related to some of Tulsa's work if we put some density bounds there. So let's define densities of things real quick. So this is an arbitrary measure, right? What are the reasonable things to try to throw stuff out on? We can define densities, because if we throw out, throw out densities, then at least morally speaking, one of these examples gets thrown out depending on whether we have an upper or lower density. Well, yeah? Fix K. Fix K. Uh, I mean, this, this should be a K here, yes. I mean, there's some fixed K, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so let, let me define what I'm gonna call, actually they're, called, they're more like weak upper and lower densities. Right, right, so the, the, the weak upper density, the weak is because I'm gonna take a soup instead of an imp here, is the limb soup as R goes to zero of mu, the volume of a ball of radius r on x over r to the k. And uh, that's sort of the, the weak lower density here is gonna be the limb imp. So uh, I'll discuss this in the context of these two examples as r goes to zero of the same thing. Okay, so, so in some sense, uh, ha having this be, be bounded kind of rules out uh, um, this, being be, th this being too large in some sense. If I'm getting my, I might be getting my inequalities backwards. I'm at a blackboard with 80 of you looking at me. <laughs> I'm going to write the corollary, and we'll figure out from the corollary what the right direction is. So in the exact same setup here, uh, if we now assume upper or lower density bounds, which is basically going to rule out one of these two examples, one can do a little bit better, right? So if the lower density at every point mu has an upper bound, then we just simply get a mass bound on our ball. So that's saying if we have upper bounds on the density everywhere, uh, on the lower density, we have upper bounds on the lower density, then, then what we've basically ruled out is, is this example over here, so that we can't actually have this guy being some ridiculous something in, in the large. Because that thing being bounded from above will actually prevent that. And two, 
if you have a lower bound on our sort of weak upper density. And those of you who think I, I'm getting these things uh, incorrectly written, I'm not. That there's a reason for, for, for the, that this is weaker than one might how normally write upper and lower densities. Then K, which is the support of all of mu, is K rectifiable. And now, if you assume both the upper and the lower bound, then mu is simply k rectifiable with an upper bound. OK. So, so let me make three points. Um, well, fine. So, so the, the assumption here, right, is that if we, so three here for time, I just won't write it. If both these things hold, then both those conclusions hold. That is to say, mu is k rectifiable with an upper mass bound. Um, so, so there, there's a, uh, uh, to put that in per sort of perspective of some other results in the literature, right, there's these results by Tulsa and Azam Tulsa that give a characterization of when something's k rectifiable. Basically, if that quantity there is point wise finite almost everywhere, then they, they prove you're k rectifiable. Uh, um, <clears throat> And, and Tulsa proved the opposite direction as well. So, so one can view this as being an effective version of one of those directions, right? right? So it, it doesn't prove that a bound on things that are k-rectifiable, simply that it gives an effective way of understanding bounds when this is actually bounded. Um, and let me point out that uh, if you think long and hard about this, you'll feel like this is too weak of a condition. To actually pull that off is because of the packing estimate. You're, you're going to have to, because the, these are soups and not imps in the way I'm writing this, uh, you, you're going to have to uh, actually get a very special covering in order to make these conclusions. And so the packing estimate is directly used in the proof here. And I think I am exactly done. Right, okay, thanks. <laughs> Oh, I'll, I'll say next.